explain the foreign policy setbacks in 1949, fall of China to the communists, the Soviet um, successful detonation of an atomic bomb, the Truman administration basically orders a complete review of U.S. foreign policy and defense spending, and the report comes out, NSC 68. And when it comes out in April of 1950, it basically talks about the Soviet Union becoming a very powerful military presence on the world stage, it increasingly acting aggressively, and NSC 68 says... The Truman administration should have a huge increase. Do you ladies understand? Sir, yes, sir. I can't hear you. Sir, yes, sir. In defense spending, it advocates a standing army, no longer just mobilizing only during times of war, huge percent increase in military spending. But Truman can't go forward. It would be very unpopular for him to pay a bunch of money amongst the American people and Congress if there is no justification directly. And he gets that justification with the Korean War. And the Korean War is going to be one of these wars that is, is oftentimes referred to as one of America's forgotten wars. Everyone knows Vietnam. Everyone knows World War II. This war in between those two is relatively misunderstood, if not unknown. Now, this is actually in Korea. This little kid, we were at this museum, and it was a music museum, culture of Korea, and they had these drums, and you could play them, and he was hogging them all. He had, like, all three just kind of, like, plopped down right in front of him, and he took his eyes off this one. I swooped in with my ninja speed and uh, started playing it, and he started acting like a little, you know what? Um, it was actually quite sad, so... Anyways, I will start an international incident in that situation. How does the Korean War begin? I'm going to give you the short, horribly simplistic version. Read your darn book for the rest. Korean War is going to last three years. June 25th, 1950. North Korea is going to attack South Korea. They're going to nearly win this thing. They're going to conquer all of the territory except for the purple. Then America and the United Nations will get involved. We will nearly conquer North Korea, and then China will get involved, and everything will go back to the 38th parallel, where the war, technically, is still being battled. Now, go back. World War II. Go back before World War II. Go back all the way until 1910. Japan had been colonizing Korea. 1910, 1905, one of those, look it up on Wikipedia. And during the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, Japan, of course, extended their empire throughout much, much of Asia. When the war is over, Japan is defeated. Korea is divided. We love dividing things during World War II post-era. Germany, Korea. They divided. One half, never guess. <laughs> Separated. It is administered by the Soviet Union. They are north of the 38th parallel. And north of the 38th parallel, the Soviets were there when the war ended. They occupy that territory. And south of that, you gotta keep them separated. Is the United States. Now, this division of Korea is supposed to be temporary. U.S. troops, Soviet troops are there. They're administering these two sections, and you have two different governments set up. Now, you don't need to go home and memorize which guy was in which area, but just in case you're interested, here are the two leaders. The Soviet had this young man, Kim. I'm not going to say it. And the United States had this gentleman. Anti-communist, communist, pro-Soviet, communist, pro-American, pro 38th parallel, beautiful. Problem, though. North Korea is going to invade South Korea. And remember, the United States has this belief, the domino theory. So what ends up happening is in June... North Korea 
bring in soldiers and military equipment, much of it from the Soviet Union. Now, there's a dispute as to whether or not Stalin knew about it. Some say he was shocked. Some say that he did give the green light. He was reluctant. It's not Soviet troops. North Korean soldiers using Soviet equipment and Soviet training crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea with the goal of trying to unite Korea around a pro-communist state. Truman sees this as a test of the containment policy in Asia. And remember what happened in 1949 for President Truman. He was seen as losing China to the communists. And he sees the situation in Korea as a Soviet-directed action. And he sees this as no different than Greece in the 1940s. And he remembers the failures of trying to negotiate, of appeasement at the Munich conference before World War II. Republicans were beating him up in Congress over his failure in China, his failure at preventing the Soviets from being the bomb. So in June 1950, this invasion takes place, shocks Truman and his administration. The war begins. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble! Now, when I was in Korea, this is actually at the Korean War Museum. This is a North Korean tank that is being, uh, you know, at, I, I learned a little Korean, so let me uh, read this to you. So if you take a look up here, it says, On Sunday, June 25th, 1950, at 4 o'clock, the tragedy of the nation began. So, yeah, I, I do speak a little Korean. So this happens. Truman has to figure out, what am I going to do? Now, this museum is pretty awesome. It's in Seoul. Check it out. Go to Korea. This is a Soviet tank. You can see by the Red Star that was used during the invasion. The whole front of the museum is just tons of military equipment. You've got bombers. You've got anti-aircraft tanks. You've got subs. You've got everything you can climb on it. I think you can. I couldn't read the directions uh, to see if it said no, but pretty cool stuff. And there's a memorial to the American soldiers who fought, as well as the South Korean soldiers, who fought against this invasion in June of 1950. Now here's what happens. Remember, we believe in the domino here. Our goal of the Cold War is communist containment. So Truman, we're waiting for the point where I say declared war. Congress never declares war. In fact, they go before the United Nations. Soviets aren't there. They can't veto. And the UN issues what basically becomes a police action. We never declare war against Korea in Congress. So the United Nations sends troops overwhelmingly. Those are made up of American troops. And like I said, the war will take place from 1950 to 1953. Here's what happens. The invasion across the 38th parallel. North Korean troops, as I stated, they pretty much get all the way down to the southern tip of the peninsula. It is not looking good. In fact, in September 1950, the troops are threatening Pusan. It is a really, really, really kind of quick defeat for the South Korean military. They're untrained, unprepared. June, the UN reacts. And they react. And a guy you've heard of before, remember where you're going to take your lady or guy on a romantic date in Los Angeles? MacArthur. Real American heroes. Real American heroes. General Douglas MacArthur leads the United Nations troops. He does a risky gamble, invades at Incheon rather than kind of confront the enemy head on. He goes behind enemy lines, massive troop buildup. That's what you saw in the previous picture. They land at Inchon, MacArthur. The Cold War has become hot. We have fighting going on. Now keep in mind, this is not U.S. troops versus Soviet troops. It's U.S. troops under the leadership of the United Nations fighting North Korean troops supplied by the Soviet Union. 
They never fight directly. What ends up happening is MacArthur lands, and if you take a look at the map over there on the right, you can see the kind of back and forth of this war. The war is going to begin. Take a look when it resets. June 1950. Boom, the invasion all the way down. Then MacArthur and the UN, they conquer. They go past the 38th parallel. So this war, you have this back and forth going play, going, going forward. Within two weeks, they pushed the North Korean military out of South Korea. The goal was achieved containment. Now Truman has a decision to make. You've just pushed the North Koreans out of South Korea. They're back on the other side of the 38th parallel. Containment has succeeded. But the goals change. You have the North Koreans on the run. Why let them go up back over in North Korea, regroup, and have the same problem again? So MacArthur and the UN gives the green light to go north, to widen the war, forget containing communism. Let's create a unified, non-communist Korea. And so MacArthur kind of gets on his own mission. He starts going north. Go ahead, make my day. In fact, the U.S. troops, the U.N. troops rather, made up of Americans and Koreans mainly, but many other countries as well, they get all the way up to this Yalu River, which borders China. China is really looking at this situation closely. They're not liking the U.S. so close to their borders. The Yalu River had strategic purposes, and China issues a threat. They basically say to the United Nations, to the United States, Stay away. <laughs> MacArthur, Truman kind of ignore China's uh, threats. They dismiss them. And on November 25th, 300,000 Chinese soldiers cross their border with North Korea. <laughs> And within a matter of weeks, the United Nations troops are pushed all the way back down to the 38th parallel. The war was swinging back and forth. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The UN troops are back all the way to the 38th parallel. MacArthur's a little frustrated. Go from Korea was nearly conquered to UN gets involved to North Korea is nearly conquered, China gets involved, stalemate. MacArthur famously says, In war, there is no substitute for victory. There's MacArthur on the right with Truman on the left, and he starts becoming very vocal against Truman. Why are we fighting a limited war with these limited objectives? We're stopping communism. Now, for Truman, he wants to avoid World War III. He does not want the Soviets or China to get involved in this situation. He doesn't want to start something big. This is a war that is a limited war for limited objectives. Our goal is containment. It went a little further. It didn't work okay. Such is life. MacArthur begins to publicly criticize President Truman. He starts talking about possibly bombing China, bombing Manchuria. This doesn't look good, because you know something very important about the U.S. military structure. What you need to know is the commander-in-chief is the president, and the general is publicly questioned. And so Truman does something that most historians give Truman a lot of credit for. April 1951. Somebody's going home. MacArthur. Is fired and publicly questioning the commander in chief. And this took a lot of guts from Truman because MacArthur was very, very popular. And a lot of Americans sided with his version of how things were going. Why are we fighting a limited war? Truman weak. And you can take a look at this political cartoon kind of showing Truman as this child trying to hold the general's position. 